I'm Dr. Scott Lyons, and you're watching or listening to The Gently Used Human. How do we navigate the fragile threads that bind us to one another and to our past? How do patterns of attachment emerge from the shadows of our upbringing, influencing not just our romantic relationships, but also our friendships, our career paths, and our very sense of self? Well, my guest today is Dr. Judy Ho, a distinguished clinical and forensic neuropsychologist, tenured professor, and author of The New Rules of Attachment. Dr. Judy, with her profound understanding of neuropsychology, sheds light on how insecure attachments carve anxious, avoidant, and disorganized trails through our lives, and how we can look at the transformative power of self-awareness, self-regulation, and the sacred act of reparenting to navigate towards healing and transformative growth. Y'all, we gotta get this. This conversation goes beyond discussing the bonds we form with others. It is an invitation to reforge the bonds within ourselves, heal the attachment wounds that hold us back, and embrace a future of secure attachment and limitless growth. Yes! Are you ready to explore the mysteries of attachment and embark on a journey towards secure connection? Yes, you are. Let's begin this. Dr. Judy, welcome to The Gently Used Human. It is such a pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, well, Dr. Scott, I'm excited to dive in with you. And obviously, we have a lot in common. We have a in lot. In terms of in- our areas of work. So, and, and also hopefully our interests and hobbies and things like that too. Absolutely. We're both football fans. Uh, well, I was a football fan right? when I was a kid. So, you know, I'm st- Yeah. R- r- you're still a for- kid. You're a big I'm kid. I'm still a kid. I'm a big kid. Yeah. I would say, do you feel like you're a big kid? Oh, for sure. For sure. I play video games every day. So you do? Uh, What's your favorite definitely. video game? Uh, well, let's see. I like recently, well, first of all, I love like the old school video games. I have yeah, one of those yeah. old school consoles where I play Street yes. Fighter. I play yes. Tekken. I play a lot of fighting games. Yeah, yeah that's too. my that's my jam. Oh my but God. I started playing a little bit of the RPGs and they are like too much for me. I'm too like, much. I can't invest 15 hours into this adventure it's too much yeah it's so true i can't i just want to play fast games you know <laughs> the, my parents recently i think got rid of or sold my nintendo like my original nintendo which i still no. played i think they were like you're an adult oh. now so you don't need it but like yeah. even like street Judgy. fighter what was the, it's on what was that the console for street fighter um Oh, I I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't called. know because I've only played them on like actual machines. Uh, so yeah, yeah. now I play them on like the, I actually invested in like a $2,000 machine where that has like a thousand video games oh. from the 80s and 90s. So like oh my- it has like Galaga and like Donkey Kong yes. and like 15 versions of Street Fighter. It's got Marvel. <laughs> it's got Pac-Man, like 10 versions of Pac-Man. I mean, it's like my heaven, you know? It's in my kitchen I, right now. So. Oh my god! Will you text it to me later? I I know we have to like other things to talk about serious things, but this is this feels important. Right. Like I want to come over yeah, and play Street Fighter. Yeah, this is very important. You. <laughs> yes, you do. You need to come over and play Street Fighter with me. We'll have like a total battle. It's yes. It was like yeah. That's so. I'm definitely oh a big god. kid. I still play video games every day. I have video games on my phone. I have Street yeah. Fighter on my phone. Yeah. Uh, I used to play Madden a lot. You know. Oh, um, I love that. I still go so, to Laser Tag for my birthdays. <laughs> In my 40s. Laser tag. Yep. Yes. I yep. love laser tag. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. I also love paintballing. Yes. I mean, yeah. I just, yeah. yeah. I'm not very good at paintballing, but I'm pretty good at laser tag. <laughs> so we can also do that the next time we'll, I see you. We'll definitely do laser tag. My whole family has like their own, the, like a family strategy too. Like my mom hides in a corner and shoots people from the corner. She just like huddles up. I run wow. around. Wow. My dad usually like guards me and like takes the hit so I can shoot other people. Oh, that's amazing. The... Yeah. Oh, that's you guys whole... sound like a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't have that kind of strategy. I just try to survive. That's pretty we'll, much it. We'll, we'll welcome you into our family. I've been definitely beaten by like six-year-olds. <laughs> okay, perfect. No, I've we'll been like definitely beaten very badly by little children. So it's not good for my <laughs> self-esteem, but I still play. <laughs> 
<laughs> I love that. Those kids are ruthless these days. Just ruthless. I know. They don't even <laughs> care. Yeah, they're like, look at that old woman trying to amble around pretending she's cool. That's probably what they think of me when I'm at laser tag. So Same, same. I get it. I get it. I feel you. <laughs> you know, speaking of kids, like when in addition to like playing video games, which I still love to do, and playing laser tag from a kid, like when I when I read your bio, I was like, oh, my God, you made my childhood dreams come true. Like, I was obsessed with forensics. Like, and <gasps> obsessed. No way. So interesting. Okay. Both, like, all those profiler shows. And I know it's not quite the same, so we'll get yeah. into what is forensic neuropsychology. But I loved the profiler shows. I had this fantasy of becoming a profiler. And did you ever watch the uh-huh. the the superhero show, like, The Flash or read the comics? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. So, so he was in forensics and then became a superhero, right. which is why I studied biochemistry because I had this oh, like wow. even in high school, I was like in AP, you know, chemistry and biology because I was like, I want to become the flash. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hey, look, we've probably had very, very similar childhood dreams. I, I think at one point I was thinking, yeah. oh, yeah, like forensic would be really interesting. Yeah. But that probably means that I have to look at dead bodies a lot. And thankfully, <laughs> as a forensic neuropsychologist, you don't have to. You don't to have to. I know. That's as a child, I was like, how am I going to contend with that? You know, <laughs> yeah. not really sure. I'm kind of a chicken when it comes to things like that. I remember during um, my doctoral program, we actually yeah. did go and observe a cadaver. Yeah. And um, it was a little much for me, honestly. I was like, I can't yeah. really do that on a daily basis. So <laughs> it, It's not yeah. for everyone. I will say when I was growing up, my babysitter was orthopedic surgery videos. So my mom was in nursing school and she was working for an orthopedic surgeon and she, she was watching a video and I came and sat beside her and I was so into it. I was so curious about it that that became my babysitter, <laughs> basically. And oh, so when I got into gosh. cadaver labs, I was so comfortable. Yeah. Um, wow. And it, it just like, like my first cadaver labs were behind a glass pan, a thing. Right. And I remember being the only one, because, you know, classes are long and stuff. And I would bring my like salad dinner and I would be eating and everyone was like, <laughs> what is wrong with you? But I had been <laughs> so conditioned to to what it what's happening that like it didn't you know yeah. I know that makes me sound yeah, a little so... a little creepy <laughs> but no I mean that's but no but I think that that we all habituate to whatever yeah. we're working on I mean and you I mean it makes sense I mean just because one of your specialties is trauma work yeah. right and yeah. I mean you take in so much anyway cadaver or not yeah I mean you have to you have to be able to tolerate enough of that so that you can help people like you can yeah. stay empathetic and connected. But you have to, there has to be some point where you just can't be rising at the same level as your patients, right? No. But oh yeah, gosh. I mean, that's what I love about your work too, is like somatic mm-hmm. experiencing work is yeah. um, oh, so amazing. I've talked to so many of my patients about, you know, having to find the right specialist for that because yeah. trauma work is not for the faint hearted. And what kind of bugs me is that there are professionals who build them out to be trauma experts, but they're really not. Yeah. Um, and they can really do more harm really than good, especially when you're working with trauma. But I mean, somatic yeah. experiencing just has so many great applications, not only for people who have been through overt trauma, but just people who are under chronic stress. Like how many yeah. of us could benefit from that? Or like people who can't really connect with traditional talk therapy, yeah. but you know that the stress lives in your body. So like, how do yeah. you release that? So anyway, I love the work that you do. I'm really glad oh. we're talking. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me on your show. I'm so excited to have you. You have such a, like, your background is so incredible. I, I mean, I remember when I was reading your bio for the first time and I was like, whoa, this human is intimidating just from their bio alone. <laughs> I mean, you as a human is so relatable and accessible, but like, okay. you know, TV shows yeah. and radio shows and, you know, so many degrees and, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm I'm excited to like tap into your wealth of knowledge and oh you know, especially gosh. around well, as we'll get into today around attachment and and all the things yes. that you're so like so keyed in on. So, but before we get into that, and I imagine we'll this will it will tra- lead us into it. But like, what does forensic neuropsychology like? If we as, like, it's I think it's unusual for people to know what that is. So I wanted to dive into it a yeah. little bit, and you're the, definitely the person to talk to. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, my day to day work as a forensic neuropsychologist is probably a lot less exciting than what one might imagine. I mean, obviously, yeah. yes, like I've been on TV shows dissecting cases, 
yeah. you know, true crime shows, right? A lot of people love to binge on that. So I get kind of like, yeah. oh, well, what does this actually look like? Well, my day to day actually is this not as is, uh, you know, intimidating in terms of working with these people who have like mass, you know, mass murders, like that's not really my day to day. Forensic neuropsychology, I, I aid as an expert in both civil and criminal cases, but really in the face of the law. So these are individuals in criminal cases, maybe um, they have been accused of some really egregious crime, and they need me to evaluate the person to say like, well, is this person, is it possible that they can be rehabilitated? Um, what wow. what might they be like if they get a lighter sentence and they get back into society? What are the chances wow. that they might actually stay productive citizens? Or are there any mitigating factors to their alleged crime that we should be considering? Wow. Um, maybe they had an untreated mental illness. Maybe there was something else. You know, the insanity defense, which is something that people talk about a lot, yeah. uh, is rarely actually works. Because I know. <laughs> very, very few people are truly, quote unquote, insane by the by the legal definition that would leave them just completely not culpable to their actions, you know? Right. As much as we want to say all of our exes are insane and sociopathic, right. it wouldn't hold up in a court of law, my friends. Does not hold. <laughs> exactly. Sorry. So like, good lesson to know. Good lesson to know. <laughs> and then mo most of my work as an expert witness is in civil cases. So really, this mm. is when, you know, there is a, per a plaintiff and a defense. The plaintiff is saying the defense has caused me some kind of bodily brain or psychological harm and then i come in to evaluate that person to determine well how much of this is actually you know what they've experienced and how much of it can actually be attributed to the defendant versus you know other things that they've gone through in their life yeah. possibly or pre-existing mental health conditions they've wrestled with so you know that's really you know i think where it gets exciting for some people is that yes i do testify in court so like does it look sometimes like what you see in law and order Yes, if I have an attorney who likes the drama. And I will yeah. say that a lot of attorneys like the drama. Like they they'll say, the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, like today I'm going to prove. I mean, some of them, I'm like, maybe you've watched Law and Order. Like, I don't know. <laughs> but so there's definitely that piece of it. And then every once in a while, I have a really good story. Like, I remember I went to a maximum security prison to evaluate an inmate. And um, yeah, they left me in some isolation room for over an hour. Oh my God. They told me. Yeah, the prison guards told me that they were going to bring the inmate for me to evaluate and just wait for a few minutes. And then I was in there for an hour without my phone, without any devices, because that's the rules of the prison. Yeah. And I had no way to contact anyone either. Finally, over an hour later, they come by and they say, oh, I'm so sorry, like, but it was kind of all hands on deck because this huge fight broke out in the yard. Uh, so we kind of forgot about you, essentially. We kind of forgot about you because we had other priorities. And then somebody was like, oh, wait, wasn't she supposed to evaluate... So anyway, I was by myself for an hour and talking to no one. And then at some point I needed to use the restroom and I had to like radio up to like the main tower. And so they said, oh yeah, just go into the hallway and we'll open the restroom door for you because everything's like kind of locked and automated. Yeah. So they opened a uh, prison cell for me to go to the restroom. <laughs> and the cell, like you can see into the cell, right? And it's just a toilet. And yeah. I'm like, wait, I, wait, I'm sorry, what? And finally... You know, 10 minutes later, like, oh, sorry. Like, we thought that the prisoner wanted to go to the bathroom. <laughs> you want to go to the restroom. And then they opened this unmarked door, and it was like a regular restroom that, you know, I can have privacy in. But, uh, so yeah, you intense. know, I don't know how the Scared Straight program doesn't work for people, because that definitely, <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm definitely Scared Straight. Yeah. Um, for, yeah. For myself. Yeah, from just that wow. experience. Anyway, so sometimes I have stories like that, but it's not That's... always a day-to-day -day thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's wild. So to go back for a moment, I mean, like, to me, to say, like, to evaluate if someone is able to come back outside of the prison or if they're able to be, what was the word? Did you say reconditioned or... Yeah, like if they like if they are going to be productive citizens of society, right. are they more likely to reoffend? You know, you kind of, yeah. you know, we're not in the prediction business, but you constantly yeah. get asked those questions like, well, what is the risk? Even if you can't totally tell us, just tell us what you know from your own clinical knowledge and what we know from research, if they have these characteristics, what they might do. Yeah, how do, how do we begin to assess if someone can rehabilitate? That to me is like, first of all, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so much pressure because yeah. I want to believe oh, totally. that that's in everyone. Yeah. And I know if I you didn't science? believe the best in everyone, you wouldn't be a psychologist. No, so, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Or you'd be a bad psychologist. <laughs> You're just, you know. <laughs> yeah. So how do we, how do we begin to evaluate if someone is quote unquote rehabilitatable or, you know, 
Yeah, I mean, I guess oh. it's, you know, I mean, it's a number of things. So first of all, okay. there's a huge, uh, you know, kind of like disclaimer that this is not, should not base all your decision making on this. This is kind of like based in theory and like yeah. past experience in my clinical work. And then after all that, it's really like, okay, does this person have antisocial personality disorder? Do they not understand or care? Do they have empathy? Do they care? Do they have any motivators for being a productive citizen? Do they have like meaningfulness in their life? I mean, you kind of evaluate all of those different factors. Are they even lying to me? I mean, sometimes again, people with antisocial personality disorder or what we sometimes colloquially call psychopaths, super charming. They know exactly what to say to you to get you to buy into something. So like, can we even believe this person when they're talking to me? Or are they just trying to charm me when they say, oh yeah, you know, I've really learned the error of my ways and yeah. I want to turn a new leaf and I'm going to start a nonprofit. It's like, are you going to do all those things or <laughs> are you just playing me? You know? Yeah. So I think hard it's a tell. lot of those things. Yeah. And it's really hard to tell. And honestly, with a lot of people who have antisocial personality disorder, how do they get close enough to their victims in the first place to commit those crimes? Like, obviously they are charming. Obviously they have some way to manipulate people. Right. So I I guess it's all of those things, but like you said, it's a lot of pressure. So you have to be really clear about the limits of what you're actually doing. Like, okay, like this is what you're tasking me with, but just so you know, you this as a hundred percent, you know, it's sort of like, this can give you an idea, a guide for decision-making, but it's not something that you can take to the bank really, you know, So it's interesting, but of course it's an important question and they have to ask it of somebody. So they ask it of forensic neuropsychologists, but I don't think that it's as easy as they were hoping. Like, oh, I would just love an answer. Like this person is 80% likely to recommit a crime. It's like, I don't have those numbers for you. And I think that that drives people crazy sometimes, right? Like in the, in the world that we work in, sometimes it's like, well, what's the cause? It's like, well, it's multifactorial. They're like, oh my God, (laughs) you just tell us the cause. Yeah. No, there's no one no. cause. No. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't work like that. And I that appreciate... really frustrates people. I know, <laughs> I know. And I, would, I really appreciate you even name like some of the factors are like, what are the resources available? Like, do they have people to come home to? Is there... Yeah. I mean, some of the things I, I think we don't... Um, most people don't recognize in, in terms of the research is like, People feel like they have value and meaning and loved ones yes. and, and to come home to. And when that's not available, it's not their fault necessarily. It, it, yeah. There's a lot of other contributing factors to why there aren't enough resources for them. And yet that's a contributing factor for how these things are evaluated about their prison time, which is, I don't know, political and... Yeah intense. I know. I know. And then I think some people who are forensic psychologists, they actually work in prison systems or jail Mm. systems. Yeah. And that's definitely not a glamorous life. I definitely have some friends who have worked in those environments. They're no longer working in those environments because it was just so tough for them to see like the day to day of what it looks like for inmates or like when they know that an inmate really needs help and like Mm. truly sincerely want that help. And they just don't have the resources and they're not prepared for it in the system. And so, you know, it's just, I think it's kind of demoralizing sometimes to work in that environment where you're like, oh, there could be more I could do, but there's not enough resources. Or just even sometimes seeing like the underbelly of the human psyche, like the people who you try your best to help them and they just don't care and don't want to change. Like, I really think that broke some of my colleagues who worked in those environments. It's painful to be on the that side of it and just yeah. not feel like something can shift and change. And like you have so much yeah. love and care for other people and for humanity. And yeah. it's like it's it's you know, it's this is it can be crushing to to not feel like you can make a difference. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. I want to take a moment to give a loud shout out to The Embody Lab, which is one of the most incredible resources for body-based and somatic therapies. This show is all about healing, and The Embody Lab does exactly that. Whether you're on your own journey of transformation and discovery, or enhancing your skill sets in your career as like a coach or a therapist, a body worker, or really any career where you are supporting other gently used humans, 
The Embody Lab is your place for deep, inspiring, and impactful workshops, certificates, masterclasses, and an incredible community of like-minded folks. I love the Embody Lab, and so do so many other people that call it a platform to come home to over and over again. The Embody Lab is giving my listeners an exclusive offer, a one-time 10% off code to enhance your embodied well-being. All you have to do is go to theembodylab.com and use the code GENTLYUSE10 at checkout. Do you ever, like, when you're doing these evaluations, do you ever just, like, go, this feels, this feels like attachment related, actually? Yeah, all like, the time. All the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Like, you know, because part of the evaluation is asking yeah. about their history and like yeah. going back to their childhood and what they remember. And it's really yeah. interesting how people consider that narrative when they have to talk about it. And it's mm. probably not a question that they think about a lot, especially mm. if they're not privy to therapy on a regular basis, right? So like, oh, like my childhood. How am I going to talk about that? Especially when you ask such an open-ended question, like, yeah. how was your childhood? Like, how would people answer that? Because I think in general, people don't ask that question, even like in dating or when you're trying to get to know somebody, like that seems like a really big question. So I don't remember like the last time, for example, when I'm thinking back to my dating days, yeah. um, where somebody just said, Hey, how was your childhood? Like, nobody <laughs> asked such a That's a red question. flag if they're asking that. <laughs> right? You're like, why are you doing that? You're a therapist? Like, trying to exactly. therapize me? Like, who knows, right? Which is so interesting. And like... It's- so anyway, nobody's asked me that question. I don't feel like and, on a um, date when somebody, asked, yeah, I don't think so. Not okay. in that way. They might be like, oh, like you know, what's your mom like? But like, they don't yeah. just go, well, how was your childhood? Like, just like such a broad question. When we're playing Street so, Fighter and you kick my ass, I'm just going to turn to you and be like, how was your childhood? I know. Turn the tables on me. I'll be like, ah, like I don't know. <laughs> Next question. Next uh, question. Yeah. yeah. Next question. So you're seeing it emerge a lot. And it makes sense. Like if you're asking just even the open yeah. question, like, how was your childhood? You're going to start to, yeah. as you dive deeper, you're going to be like, ooh, there was a lot of misses perhaps that led to yeah. some significant ramifications an, as an adult. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, for everyone listening, it's like no one had a perfect childhood, right? So like, that's not you know, most people have had some experiences in childhood, even if you had very well-meaning parents that did shape who you are and maybe sometimes in a negative way, but maybe your parents, they were still doing their their best, you know? And I I would like to think that most of the times that's what's happening, but maybe they were overwhelmed and didn't have enough resources or self-knowledge. Of course, there's a smaller proportion of parents who like really mean to inflict harm on their children, which is so sad. And they were abusive and it was totally on purpose. But, you know, no matter what that, experience was like, I think most people would say, yes, I've had at least a few things that have happened to me in my childhood that I still remember today. And they were not positive experiences for me. Yeah. And you just wrote a book about this, which I am so excited for you. You just wrote, and it comes out soon, The New Rules of Attachment. Dr. Judy, what happened to the old rules? The old rules didn't really what cover it. <laughs> no, they like, didn't. The old rules. Yeah, so they all... <laughs> yeah, yeah. The old rules are so so crazy. Fucking archaic. Yeah, right. Like, come on, let's like get into the what? What century are we in now? I mean, we're twenty twenty four. Like, yeah, I can't even believe that, right? But but definitely, I think the old rules. I mean, you have to remember, attachment came in like the mid nineteen fifties, sixties. Like that was when it was first started as an idea that was studied by psychologists. And so, yeah, there are definitely some archaic ideas that we've taken. I think when I look in social media, online articles, I'm still seeing that attachment is talked about all related to romantic relationships, which I get it. That's when people get the most interested, like how does this play out in my intimate relationships? Of course, that's still important, but that's not the only impact of attachment. In fact, attachment affects all the different parts of your life your career, how you go after your goals, your family relationships, your collegial relationships, your friendships, all of it. So that's one part of the new rules. The other part of the new rules is that in the archaic idea, it's more like, okay, I have this insecure attachment style. How do I deal with it? How do I manage it? How do I make sure it doesn't affect me in bad ways? 
And people didn't realize that you can actually change your attachment style at any time. You can actually heal your insecure attachment style at any age, even if your parents or people who were involved in maybe creating the insecure attachment are not available to do the work with you or don't want to do the work with you. And then I think the last piece um, that's really important is that there isn't so much dialogue about how it all really comes down to your self-concept, you know, who you believe you are at the core. Attachment affects that. And that's why it has these impacts 20, 30, 40, 50 years after you were born, even though you're saying, well, a lot of these experiences are in my first three, four, five, seven years. So why is it affecting me now? Well, it's because it was at a time when you were forming your beliefs about who you are, how people will react to you in the world and what kind of outcomes you deserve in life. And so the new rules of attachment are all about unpacking that and rebuilding your self-concept so that it is secure, that is being reparented by your adult self and that your insecure attachment roots are not affecting your beliefs and your outcomes for yourself ultimately. Yes. Thank you. I love this because uh, (laughs) for all you listening, the old rules of attachment are a little well intended, but bonkers. Uh, Just FYI, (laughs) some of the archaic shit is all like, we blame the mother. Like, I know. Right. Can exactly. we just have it's a moment for fault. that? It's can all the mom's fault. Yeah. You know, it never blames yeah. the baby. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with that? It's a dyad after all. It's, wrong. it's a dyad. Um, it's right. a relation. No, but it's like, it doesn't look yeah. at, you know, uh, multiple people in a family system. It doesn't recognize community yeah. in relation to attachment. It doesn't recognize uh, socioeconomic or other contributing factors of uh, resources. It's fucking archaic. Yeah. So thank you for writing this, the new rules of attachment. Yeah, thanks. And also I would say that when we start to blame our parents. Yeah. That anger really just like festers and affects your life negatively. Like, I mean, sometimes it feels great to be angry and it feels great to blame someone. But ultimately, that anger, if it just festers instead of just like, okay, I had a moment, I'm processing it, I'm understanding it, but it's just more like a chronic anger and blaming it only affects your life negatively. Like, some at some point you have to let go and say, well, what can I do now? Like, now that I know that that was an issue, even if I'm mad at them, like, how can I move forward? And yeah. take the ownership of the pieces that I can change. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something really nuanced in this too that I found in working with people of like, look, this is this is not to say that some of our parents weren't total, totally unavailable, uh, hurtful, painful. Again, there right. is no perfect parent. So, but and there's a scale of uh, hurt, harm, etc. And you know, I found in working with people that sometimes they they had a feeling of anger towards their parents, especially as they're exploring Mm -hmm. attachment theory. And I found that they kept having to recycle the story in their mind about their parent to hold on to that anger, to maintain the the sort of sense that a boundary or something in that relation. So in some ways they were hurting themselves by continuously recycling the story that provided the feeling of anger. Right. Yeah, that's such a good point. And um, it's so easy just to get into that loop, right? Especially when you're not talking to people about it, or maybe the people you're talking to are like amping you up, like, yeah, you should be angry. Oh, like, fuck you your know. parents. Uh, yeah. The yeah. fuck your parents know, cheerleading like squad. At first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, feels great at first, but then at the yeah. end, it's like, well, like, it's just festering. Like, anger literally just like rots you from the inside out, you know? Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Any, it, it can be so difficult for people to move past that. So yeah, this book is like, okay, acknowledge yeah. that, you know, and obviously there are some parents who are like just horrible parents yeah. and maybe yeah, they even did it intentionally and that sucks, but you can still move past that and say, you know what? Fine. Like, yeah, you know, they suck. They're awful people, but now what? <laughs> now yeah. what? Right? Now what? Like, yeah. Let's move forward. Yeah. yeah. So Let's let's uh, drop back to the basics, if you know what I mean, and <laughs> get to mm-hmm. like for folks who are new to this idea of attachment theory, who, um, you know, and, and I don't think there's that many, but I do think if we go mm-hmm. back and we go from a, a new rules of attachment perspective, how do we define attachment? Yeah. And, and yeah, let's start there. Well, attachment is the emotional bond or connection that develops between 
individuals, particularly between infants or young children and their primary caregivers. And so this is a very crucial bond because it happens at a time when we as little babies and little toddlers, we are in survival mode and we cannot fend for ourselves. So obviously it's very different in different parts of the animal kingdom, but generally for mammals like humans, like you are born super cute (laughs) for a reason. You're born super cute because you have to get adults to be like, you're so cute. And even though you scream and like you poop yourself and like you throw up and you're disgusting, like you're so cute that I want to take care of you. It's crucial for us to survive, to be cute. That's why Uh, little puppies are so cute. Little kittens are so cute, right? I mean, there's a reason for that so that you can live. It's so Um, true. I remember in evolutionary biology class when they said that for the first time, they're like, cuteness is a survival strategy. And I was like, Oh my God. So true. That's so true. Right. right. <laughs> but for certain animals like amphibians, like it's not as important because they can kind of survive on their own, even from a young age. So like, it's less important for them to be cute, but yeah, yeah. like, you know, mammals for sure. We need to be super cute for this reason. And so, yeah. you know, how it affects you as the young person in this relationship is that it's also the time where you're soaking up the knowledge of the world and learning who you are and how people are going to respond to you when you have a need and you express it. And if people are going to love you, even though you cry and scream and like poop your diaper, you know, so that is actually really important knowledge because when you're a baby, you hold as a blank slate, like, Oh, what is there? What is there to learn about this world and how I reside in it? And that's why these early messages carry on for so long, because sometimes as an adult, If you experience like, let's say a rude person, you're just like, okay, well, that's on you. Like, that's not about me. But when you're a little baby or a toddler, if someone is rude to you, your natural inclination would be is to say, well, what does that mean about me? Right? So these questions that you ask yourself as a child learning about the world versus one who's been in the world already, and just know that there are like crazy people out there who are going to like honk their horn at you and scream at you in traffic. And I say this because I live in Los Angeles happens all the time, you know? So it's like, you know, that sometimes that's not about you, right? Yeah. But as a child, everything is about you. And it's like, you're self-centered in the way that not that you're a selfish self-centered, but just more like, well, I'm the center of the universe in my little child mind. So like, if something bad happens, it must be my fault. Or what did I do about it? What did I do to contribute to it? So that's why these lessons stick with us for so long. So long. And they, and they get like yeah. embedded in our cellular structure and our, and our, and our yeah. wiring. And it's just, and so what are some of the styles that come out, whether, you know, whether that emotional bond is present or what happens when it's not? Yeah. Yeah. So You know, I really say that, again, when we talk about these primary caregiver bonds, like it's kind of like the 80-20 rule where if a parent is 80% generally consistent and available to the child and addresses their needs in a way that the child wants, your child's going to be fine. Your child's going to develop secure attachment. Um, So for parents out there who are like, oh my gosh, I just did this thing yesterday and is my child going to have insecure attachment? No, because if that was like less than 20% of the time, you're totally fine. Um, But I think it's more about like a pattern of not meeting your child's needs or like shutting them down when they express a need or going back and forth between maybe meeting their needs sometimes or like cursing them out. It's like that level of inconsistency that makes the child feel unsafe in some way, they then start to enact a certain type of defense that helps them to still navigate life in a way that will at least ensure their survival, even if they can't thrive, right? So that's how insecure attachment develops. And I think for people who develop the anxious attachment style, there's three insecure attachment styles. So the, for the people who develop the uh, anxious attachment style, they may have had parents who either made it seem like the world was a super dangerous place. So then they start to adopt some of that themselves and start to get overly anxious about it. Or these parents were just maybe pretty inconsistent in like the messaging that they had about what they really should be doing with their lives, even as a child, you know, like do this or don't do that. Like their messaging is kind of complex and not consistent. So then the child really is more heightened to this idea of, well, I have to do whatever I need to do to please people so that they can still care about me and love me. I can't lose sight of them because, you know, if I don't do what they ask, then they could just disappear. And then what what will happen to me? And so then they become these like 
quintessential people pleasers, but also their self-esteem is so predicated on other people's opinions of them and whether or not people are reinforcing them on a frequent basis. So that tends to be the developmental script for the anxiously attached. The avoidantly attached individual, I think that sometimes when you look from afar, it's almost like a Monet, like they look amazing. They're like super perfectionist, like they get everything done. But that's a survival strategy because they had parents who either shut down their negative emotions, like, please don't complain, like, just pretend you're happy. Like, why are you complaining? Um, or the parents made them parentify children at a young age, like you need to be responsible for my happiness. Mm -hmm. So when that happens, avoidantly attached people, they develop the script of, you know what, it's just easier for me to be someone who fends for themselves, who focuses more on achievements more than people. And uh, even when I'm suffering, I'm not going to tell anybody about it because you know what? They're not going to help me anyway. So like just going to suffer in silence and isolate myself when something happens. And so avoidantly attached people, again, from the outside, they might look like they have it all, but like their inner coping system really precludes them from having that important connection we need for humans, um, all humans, no matter if you call yourself a loner or not, we all need it to survive. And that's just biology. And then the disorganized attachment, I think, is the most misunderstood. I think that when I look in popular media, they're like, it's a combination of anxious and avoidant. Or like, this is the one where you can never have a relationship with them and they're super fucked up. And it's like, that is not the f one that's not helpful. No, and that's two, not helpful. When, when I, yeah, well, or true. that's not helpful. Yeah, or true. Exactly. And then I, when I have patients who um, have disorganized attachment, they kind of see themselves as lost cause. Like that is not what it is at all. Disorganized attachment is the attachment style that tends to have the most trauma associated, however. So like it does mean that probably in their childhood, they have experienced some kind of trauma or some extreme stressor of some sort. And what that has led to um, is just a very inconsistent style of coping. Like they don't really have a consistent strategy. So like anxious attached, their strategy is like people pleasing and like watching their environment for cues that they're okay. Avoidantly attached main coping strategy is like, do everything yourself, like focus on things rather than people. And, you know, basically like just figure out a way to do it on your own. So, but there's a consistency to those coping strategies, even if they're not working all the time. The disorganized person mostly will have like erratic strategies. So like from time to time, it's like, well, I'll do this in one situation. I might pull away from this person in this one situation, but in this other situation, I might actually cling to them further and like do attention getting things to make sure they don't leave. Um, but it's not always predictable. And so that also leads to the most internal emotional dysregulation. Like they themselves feel dysregulated all the time and they have a lesser confidence that they can achieve things that they really want because most of the times they're kind of in a fight or flight mode of let me just get the basics down. Like I just want to survive today as opposed to thinking about thriving, right? So like that I think is probably the hallmark of disorganized attachment is that they're just constantly in a fight or flight state and it's harder for them to actually think about those higher order things that make us happy as humans, like self-actualization. Like, what do I actually want in life? What's going to bring me meaningfulness? They just don't have as much time to get to those questions. Yeah, such a such a beautiful description, so accessible. And I felt like you were calling me out on all my attachment styles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny. I feel like if you're listening uh, to show or watching it right now, you you might be like, ooh, Dr. Judy just read me and know that it's done with love. <laughs> know that it's done with a lot of love because it's like, I think too often in pop culture, it's like a blame game. We went from blaming the mom to now kind of like shaming, blaming the individual with the attachment style. Right. And that's icky, right. y'all. That's not, that's not, that's not the real yeah. deal. That's not the like kind, no. compassionate, humanistic approach that it's meant to have. And even when you're saying like yeah. the disorganized piece, I really appreciate you taking it out of like the, the sort of shameful consideration that, that so many people have sort of popularized. And, and I think part of the challenge of that one and, and why sometimes it's written more negatively about is because the receiver of, of that being in relationship to someone who, with more of the disorganized and secure attachment style, it's less consistent, more confusing, and it can be unanchoring and challenging in that yeah. way. So then they don't know what to do because they have a loss of consistency right. and sense of self. And that's probably pretty triggering. Yeah, definitely. And I think attachment styles can, like, just, like you just alluded to, they can trigger one another, right? Yeah, so yeah, for sure. The, probably the most common attachment 
grouping, I'll call it, whether it's in a romantic relationship or even like best friends or whatever, tends to be like anxious and avoidant. And then they, they're constantly just in this cycle, right? Where the one person is like asking for more from the other person and they're seen as clingy from the other person. And then the anxiously attached person sees the avoidantly attached person as aloof and like, I, he doesn't care about me or she doesn't care about me or whatever. It's tough because that they're just like constantly triggering each other's attachment issues. Yeah. It's a, it's a, par- it's an attachment party and everyone's invited, but we tend yeah, to gravitate att- <laughs> towards certain people at the party, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or even just like this idea of like a fix it mentality, right? It's oh, like, yeah, Oh, sure. like, let me fix you. Yeah. I feel like I definitely felt like in my early twenties, like that was sort of like a crusade I was on. I was like, whenever somebody was like, I'm broken, I'm like, I can fix you. Oh, like, I would say, help. let me date you. <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah. Well, yes, I dated them too. Um, yeah. Not and then, at the same you know, time. and then if you like, oh my God, right. Well, I, I mean, this is before well, I had my license. So oh, I okay. think, so we I did. think we... that was the part of me that wanted to help people, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. like, and I would like, yes. And some of them were the people that I dated. And then once I got my license and I was actually helping people on a regular basis, I was like, you know, I don't really want that in my dating life. Actually, that's too much. You know, I don't want to have to fix somebody in my personal life, as well as my professional life. But I think, yeah, in, yeah, in my early 20s, when I was still in school, it's like you had this innate wanting to, to help people. And so yeah, of course, that would happen oftentimes in like your most intimate relationships where tell me like, I'm not sure if I could love anyone. I'm like, but I can make you love me. Like, you know, it's that mm-hmm. challenge that you give yourself. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, you know, you can, you can't fix somebody else's problems. That's what I've learned with, you know, my, my age and my wisdom that's developed over the decades. Um, you know, they have to want to help themselves as well. And, yeah. you know, you also have to watch out for your own baggage. We all have sure. baggage as we get older. Yeah. And sometimes you just trigger each other's baggage. So you do have to have responsibility for yourself. But yeah, yeah, I mean, and and I think that that's why I see that it goes back so far, right? So like when I think about my friends who have had like the most prominent attachment issues, even these people that I dated, especially in my early 20s that had their attachment issues. It's like, I can all I can see now with my knowledge and understanding now, like where it all came from. It's like, oh my gosh, like you really hate women. Like, why do you Mm. hate women so much? And then it's like this one person that I dated, his mom was sadly like an untreated drug addict all of his life. So not only was she not present, like he was just used to her being super erratic. So yeah, I mean, I should have seen this in our early, you know, dating, uh, you know, even the first few dates, he would just say things like, well, you women, like he would say certain things like that. And I was like, it's kind of like just a weird joke. Yeah. Again, I think I was too innocent then maybe like yeah. just like took it as a joke as opposed to like, oh, that's a red flag yeah. that he says that. <laughs> yeah. um, and that he thinks that all women are like that. Even if it's a joke, like jokes are mostly 50% true and yeah. there's something behind that joke. So yeah, it took like months of our dating before he told this to me. Oh my gosh. And it was also really sad because his mom eventually committed suicide. So there was just a lot of things there. I mean, it was like accidental or intentional suicide. Like there's yeah. un- like slightly not clear, but she overdosed. Uh, so um, it's a, a, again, so it's like so heavy, but like when you look at him and like the way he presents himself, super jovial, like not, like hmm. everything just like brushes off him. Right. And so people develop their defense mechanisms from their unhealed attachment wounds. Absolutely. This show is also brought to you by the absolutely stunning and powerful tools of transformation that are created by Omala. Oof, even the name Omala transports you to a place of flow and vitality. These are some of my favorite products ever. They have an amazing color-changing yoga mat that responds to your temperature and presence and reflects back your posture in real time. There's this incredible smelling skin balm candle that heats up to activate all the essential oils and vitamins that your skin has been craving. I mean, look, if I could live in a giant bath of this candle, I would 100% do it. They also have these journals that lead you into profound insight, and then you get to plant those journals to create a stunning flower garden. What? I mean, if that's not deep and inventive, I don't know what is. 
If you're someone who desires to live a luxurious flow of life and who believes in transformative wellness, then you have to check out Omala. Omala is giving my listeners an exclusive discount to treat yourself to something that is as special as you, boo. All you have to do is go to omala.com, that's O-M-A-L-A.com, and use the code DRSCOTT10 at checkout. And a portion of every purchase goes to an incredible charity. You got this. You talk about this a lot in the book, you know, that's part of like the new rules of attachment is like, it's not just about relationships, which I really so appreciate. I mean, like you and I both get asked to write stuff all the time for the news or talk on the news. And they're like, tell us about how attachment relates to relationships. It's hot to trot. It's like a hot topic, but it's actually like, that's just a small fraction of its impact. Yeah. So tell us how else it shows up in our lives. Or impacts our life. Yeah. So attachment affects how you approach your career, what you think is important to do in your career, whether or not you thrive in your career, whether to focus more on beating everybody around you or like pleasing everybody around you. Or fixing everyone around you. Fixing everyone around you. (laughs) Exactly. And yes, and it affects, you know, how you go about your friendships, even, you know, what role you play in your friendship group. Are you that person who is like the social organizer who like wants to bring everybody together, but you like find yourself constantly in that spot, not necessarily because you like doing it, but because you maybe fear being left out if you don't take on that role. Um, Are you the social person in your friendship circle who like, rolls in in your own car, rolls out when they want, like never wants to carpool with anybody, even though your neighbor's going to the same party, you know, like, and what's really behind that, you know, um, why, why the control in those situations? Um, are you the person who thinks that you're going to finally conquer this new goal that you've set for yourself this year, but then halfway through, you're just like, I don't even deserve it. Or like, what am I even doing? You just all of a sudden start questioning your own motives. You know, it also affects just, how you think about yourself, you know, ultimately, you know, do you believe that you deserve good things to happen to you or not? Or do you self sabotage them along the way? Because oddly, your mind wants to be consistent. So when it sees something that's inconsistent with a previous belief, even if it's not good for you, you find some way to make it consistent. That's the way that your mind generally works. If you don't actually take a microscope to it and say, okay, like, this is a thought I'm having, but like, I need to make this I need to make this thought work for me instead of just reconfirming over and over again, my wounds and like this belief that I have about myself that I don't deserve good things. Mm, That's so sad. And it's like, and it's so prevalent and it's so loud. And so many of us, and we might not be have even recognized that that's a trace back to these sort of fissures in our early bonds. Exactly. And And I think the early bonds too, you know, it's because it's such a template for how we think about ourselves, um, even as we grow up, they're just, they're just so hard to, to unpack if you're not paying attention to it. And I would say that as a here and now therapist for like the majority of my career, I would say Mm -hmm. that when I was in training mostly for CBT, I probably was one of those people who kind of brushed aside past totally. experiences it's like okay sure the past experiences but what are we going to do about it now like let's focus on now and you can see how like as a beginning therapist that would be so nice it's like a concrete yeah. thing to hold on to and it's not as messy if you mm-hmm. just say let's work on how you're feeling today or the problem yeah. in front of you today but if you don't look at the roots of those problems they're just going to keep happening again For sure. so that's where i became first interested professionally at okay, like we need to look at those early roots because they affect your today, right? And without unpacking that, you're just going to keep having the same patterns happen over and over. And then you're going to get dejected sometime along the way because you're going to say, well, what? I've been in therapy for 10 years. This is still happening. Or like, oh, I thought that I already knew myself to some degree and like I've done all these skills and somehow it's still not really working to help the biggest problems of my life. And I think that's where attachment really comes in. It's like, are you willing to go back so that you can have a better future and a better today, right? That's really why attachment is so important. Yeah. And even, I think there's something really to say from like, 
you know, a lot of the strategies we use to, to go into the past are about doing it in the here and now, like yeah. do, using right. present presence work to be like, how are you feeling in your yes. body now in relation to that too? So it's not like we magically transport ourselves to being a one-year-old either, uh, yeah. which is yeah. what I love about your exactly. work is like, really, it's like as the adult individual now there's so many strategies let's talk to that little kid let's hold that little kid there's yeah. let's see how it shows up you know and deconstruct it and again that's what you d- uh, describe me as the new rules like it's a t- like we can attend to it it's not our destiny yeah our survival strategies right. are not our exactly. destiny yeah Exactly, exactly. And the survival really only keeps you in those like lower rungs of Maslow's hierarchy, right? When we talk about just like the safety needs and the physiological needs, but those higher rungs of like self-esteem, socialization, connectedness, self-actualization, you can't get to those until you pass this level of I'm just here to survive, right? Day to day. And I think that some people who have been struggling with depression or anxiety for a long time or trauma, PTSD, alcoholism and drug addictions and process addictions, that's kind of how they feel a lot of the time. It's like, how do I just get through today? Like, I just want to get through today. And I just want to help people to get past that feeling of like, I'm just getting through today and to actually look forward to parts of their life. I mean, none of us look forward to every single part of your life. Like that's ridiculous too. I mean, like you have to find that balance, right? Like I feel like some of that toxic positivity out there is now coming from, Oh, you know, when you go to your job, you're supposed to love every moment. It's like, I'm sorry. I really feel like I am in the career I'm supposed to be in. I am living my calling. And there are still days where I'm like, Oh, I don't really want to do this today. (laughs) I don't want to have to do this right now. But I think it's more just about like, do you wake up in the morning and you can actually point to something that you look forward to every single day? Doesn't have to be the whole day. Doesn't even have to be the majority of the day. But it's like, okay, today's going to be a tough day at work. However, like tonight, like I'm super excited because X, right? There's, you have to have some place of like looking forward to and thriving as opposed to just, how do I get through today without? bursting into tears, you know, Mm. how do I get through today without having a panic attack? Like, I really want to help people realize that there's more to life than that. And, and you write about in your book, you know, that the, that our attachment styles or stances really affect our visioning of our life and the, the actualization and conception of our goals. Can you talk more about that? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think when you have insecure attachment style, you put limits on your life. You know, you Mm. put limits on the kinds of things that you dream for yourself, how big those dreams are, how positive they are. So like as an example, if you have avoidant attachment, many of your dreams that you're willing to write down and acknowledge consciously are probably more related to achievements and goals and bucket list items. And like, you know, I'm going to run a marathon, I'm going to get this promotion. And you don't even write down, for example, that maybe you dream of like having an awesome partner you know, a great romantic relationship or like a best friend you can really confide in and like do things with, you know, those tend to be less of the dreams that people with avoidant attachment, you know, imagine for themselves. And then people who have anxious attachment, most of their dreams have to do with connections with somebody else, as opposed to being in their own footing and like being able to do things on their own. It's always kind of reliant on like what other people think of them or like their piece of a puzzle in a relationship one way or another And then people with disorganized attachment, I think a lot of the limits are just, you know, the actual thriving part of it. Like, I'm not really willing to put out there that, like, I think I deserve these bigger, grander things in life, you know, because I'm going to be so disappointed when that doesn't happen for me. And I really don't think that at the core, I can do that. And so I think that when you have insecure attachment, it affects all of these aspects of what you think about when you think about your outcomes, because it affects how you feel about yourself and who you think defines you or what defines you. Like, what do you actually think is part of your self-concept? You know, Mm. it changes the way that you experience yourself as a being in this life. And that's why it affects your visioning because, you know, that comes from you. Yeah. I really appreciate that. I think, you know, things like self-awareness, self-esteem, all, all the yeah. like big psychology words they just put self in front of. Like you have to have a right. self <laughs> and a sense of secure sense of self yes. and self-concept to have those things. And if there's exactly. some type of like challenge 
early in these, uh, in, you know, in our lives that affect these, that, you know, turn into an insecure attachment style, as you talk about in your book and you, you know, it affects your sense of self, the development of who and how and where and why you are. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's so, that's why it's so hard. I think um, when you don't have a professional helping you or maybe just, you know, some of the exercises in this book yeah. to, to unpack it yourself. Cause it feels so big, right? You're yeah. like, Oh, like my whole sense of self. <laughs> I don't know where to start. It's an existential fucking nightmare. It's like, <laughs> exactly. It's an existential <laughs> crisis. So it's like, yeah. so obviously you need help. You need to like yeah. talk to a professional, yeah. talk to another self-aware person, use the exercises in this book, but it is achievable, right? It is, yeah. it is, it is something that you can attain. But yeah. I think in the beginning, when you like recognize the impact and how it just affects you, a lot of people don't do this work. Yeah. on their own because that's just yeah. too scary to do it's, by yourself it's yeah. hard it's hard to hold the mirror yeah. up and be living uh, out yeah. a survival strategy at the same time and and right. have the skills and the resources to make a change like shifting a survival strategy is a threat to our innate system of survival exactly like you're supposed to somehow let go of this that's at least worked for you in some shape yeah. for all of your life because yeah. at least you're still here, you yeah. know, and you're supposed to say, yeah, have trust, have trust, um, have trust that if you let go of this clinging to the survival, that you're going to have a much better life. That's scary. But the trust is not in the universe necessarily, or like in other people, the trust is in yourself. Yeah. And that's a big part of the work of reparenting is like, you are an older and wiser person now with more resources than you had when you were two or four when these things happen to you. And so if you can't trust anything else, trust that your adult self can do more than your child self could at the time that it developed these survival strategies. So well said. So well said. You know, going back to the self-concept piece for a moment, you know, in my work that's more you know, somatic and I'm a, I trained as a developmental uh, movement th or developmental therapist. And, uh, I think about like, you know, when in those early years, when there isn't co-regulation, one of yes. the main strategies we have, and when we talk about like no co-regulation means that for whatever reason, the parent didn't have enough resources or skills or the yeah. caregivers didn't or the community yeah. didn't to hold the child in their dysregulation, which is part of what it is to be right. a child to then co-regulate, give them some, the adult gives them some of their regulation so that they can learn it themselves. And when that's not available, we see these attachment styles emerge too. And, you know, one of the things that's not often talked about is when we're not co-regulated, when we're not given enough support and resources, many of us go into immobility or freeze response. Exactly. And Exactly. When we're yeah, and when we're frozen, it, it dampens our ability to move and register our movement, which is how, as infants, we start to map a sense of embodied self. And I, I, you know, it's so I love that you're drawing all those parallels too in your in your work about like self concept is such an integral part of attachment. Yeah, so beautifully said, uh, Doctor Scott, because I think that that's that's the missing key, you know, for for a lot of people is this idea of co-regulation. So when you don't learn that from your primary caregivers or important adults in your life at a young age, you don't eventually take that for yourself and learn self-regulation. I mean, co-regulation is like the first ingredient to learning self-regulation. Um, without co Again, because when you're a kid, you can't do anything for yourself. So like no. you need co-regulation as a template, as a model to then be like, oh, and now I can take that and like do it myself. Right. Yeah. Um, and so no wonder why so many of us say like we feel dysregulated or people say that they have nervous system dysregulation. I know you must work with a lot of people who experience these types of symptoms and it affects your life in so many ways. And it all goes back to like not learning regulation at a time when your body and my mind were primed to take on these skill sets. And so the good news though, is that again, as an adult, you can teach regulation you can co-regulate your inner child right and like for people who are like well that's just too much for me to like that just feels so abstract but but it's not abstract because mm -hmm. there's a part of you there's a part of you 
that has been with you from the very beginning of life, right? It's like the you that has existed since the day you were born. And that part of you saw all your traumas and stresses as a child and like been through your whole entire life. And then there's the part of you that is like who you are today, you know, how you experience yourself today. And it's really just about an interaction of like those two parts of your mind, right? It's the part of your mind that's like, I carry these old memories. And there's a part of you that's like, here I am today. And here is who I am today. I'm the mindful space. Here I am now. And like the dialogue that these two parts of your mind have with each other is no real different from just when you like have self-talk, right? When you talk to yourself while you're getting ready during the day, when you talk to yourself, when you're about to go do a big presentation or go into an interview, it's just, it's so much of like what we do all the time as human beings. It's just like have thought processes that are kind of ongoing. So now this is just a dialogue between those two parts of your mind. Yeah. Amazing. So I thought this part of the show, you could diagnose me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you have like is is a survey um the survey the quiz i mean is the quiz for people to get better attuned to sort of maybe what their attachment styles are um is that in just in your book or is it on your website as well where can people take the quiz yeah so the attachment quiz is in my book um yeah. if you uh yeah so it's definitely in my book it's also available on my website yeah. Um, so you can get a preview to it, um, even without buying the book, just so you can learn what your attachment style is. Because that's obviously the, the biggest part of the work. Um, so yeah, totally. So if you want to take that quiz, Dr. Scott, and share with me your <laughs> findings. We can oh, trade Dr. Judy, information. We, I, uh, I am well aware what the findings will say. <laughs> you you're know, like, it's just uh, going to be confirmatory. <laughs> oh, it's, it, it's, it's 99% anxious and 1% mixed. No, I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, my old, my old style, I would say, and, and I've done a lot of work and, and really appreciate, I mean, the somatics was a big, big game changer for me. Your type, the work that you do, big game changer, the more relational work, big game changer. And it's like, the thing I, and why I appreciate the new rules of attachment so much is because like, yeah, I've seen my relationships change. I've made um, more informed decisions about the relationships I enter, which is great and how I interact. Mm -hmm. But my sense of self is more clear as you're talking about. Like, yeah. um, I have more visioning of my future. I remember as a kid, people would say, like, what's your five-year vision? I'm like, getting through today, you know? Right. Exactly. And it's, <laughs> like yeah. we talked about. Yeah. And so I really, so I really appreciate the new rules of attachment offers hope and practicality. Thank you. I really, I, I really hope that that's what people take from it too. And mm -hmm. like you were saying, you know, we all have shadows of our old attachment styles, but then mm -hmm. you're obviously a living embodiment of like, if you do the work and you get to know yourself, like you can get to the other side. And yeah. I think my old attachment style was most likely avoidant. I mean, it's pretty oh. clear. So we, um, we would have dated. Yeah. Is what so we would have been exactly. <laughs> we would have been either romantic been partners or best friends, you know, one or both, you know, <laughs> but, it, but it's true. I mean, there's like definitely a gravitation of those styles. Yeah. And I think that, um, so much of the work too, as you heal, is that it's not that the shadows won't ever emerge, especially when you're in stressful times. I oh think that they God. do emerge. And then it's more about like, okay, but you know what? Like, this is a new way that I'm going to tackle this, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like one thing that for sure is an avoidant attachment thing that still happens to me when I'm in a moment of stress or crisis is like, I just shut everybody out. Like, I just try to deal with it on my own. And it's been like a lot of a journey for me to say, no, like you have to fight that. Like you must still engage your social world. Uh, don't keep trying to do it on your own or like just don't talk to people when you're going through a major stressful moment, you know, but that is totally still my go-to coping if I'm not careful. So I'm like, okay, you know what? Like you're going to have to force yourself to like talk to one person today about yeah. what's going on. I love that. I love that strategy. Yeah. yeah the Where mine comes up is still like, if there's a rupture in a relationship, uh, I will go to, I, I can't pause until we've talked about it for at least eight hours and I made amends yeah. and there's some, like the repair is yes. complete of like, the, like going past the yeah. level of exhaustion into like the ideal repair. Yep. And uh, it's also learning repair enough 
is one of the things I've learned in my moving towards more secure is like repair enough. Yeah. Repair yeah. enough. Yes. I've talked about this with my colleagues and I'm like, really? what a concept, you know? I love that. I'm like, yeah, like sometimes it just has to be good enough. Like it doesn't yeah. have to be. And also everybody's got a different limit for how much they want to talk about something. Right. And so that's another piece, but that is so interesting. I mean, so like another avoidant attachment shadow yeah. that I have is like, I could get into like, you know, an interpersonal conflict with somebody we might be doing, like it obviously doesn't feel good. Yeah. But um, what's super weird is like, I could be thinking about it as I'm getting ready for the day. I'm like, oh man, like I really want to make sure that I get to the bottom of this with my husband, et cetera. Yeah. But then like the minute that I'm at work, like I'm almost too good at compartmentalizing. It's mm. almost like all of it just goes away. Yeah. And then like, I feel super great about myself. Cause I'm like, okay, like I'm in my wheelhouse. I'm like working and like helping patients or like doing an interview or like writing my book yeah. or like teaching. And it's like, okay, you know what, Judy? Like, maybe that's too extreme. Like, <laughs> maybe there's still be a, like a moment where you're thinking about like, hey, like, I had an argument with my husband this morning that I really want to make sure to resolve. But like, when I'm at work, it's like, yeah. it just disappears. Yeah. And like, yeah. when somebody has avoidant attachment roots, they're more likely just to like bank everything into like their job, right? That's like a yeah. form of like coping for them. It's just like, yeah. go to your job and feel better. It's like, okay, you know what? Like, there's got to be somewhere in between where, you know, still bothers you a little bit, like while you're yeah. at work, you know? So yeah. anyway, very interesting. Yeah. I love, I love this. <laughs> this is the new podcast is called Attachment Confessionals. And I know, uh, I know. The I new feel like is, this is what's happening right now. <laughs> all right. Here's my con next confessional. Okay. If I go through a breakup, I will take weeks off of work. <laughs> oh, I will yeah. plan yeah. time in my schedule to sit there and be with it. For like an ex wow, way you're too so long. Brave. I, well, yeah. I'm not sure that's the best strategy, actually. Like, I think some compartmentalization, like the strategy of also being like, and now I should also function as an adult. Yeah. <laughs> some time of the day, too. As opposed to like, right. I'm going to go on the floor and have a good cry for six hours and really yeah. process all the roots of what I uh, did wrong and what I could do better and, you know, like that. So part of, I think, secure attachment is also doing some compartmentalization like or auto-regulation. Like yeah. Auto-regulation. Auto yeah, I love that. Yeah. See? Yeah, see? Like, so when I when I had a breakup, I would just, like, make another goal. I'd be like, I'm running a marathon now. <laughs> so that definitely tracks, right? Oh, I would have gotten so much more work done. Function. Yeah, yeah. I, I was, like, some of the most productive well, during my breakups, you know, it's like, man, like I just got so much done. People are like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I don't know. But like, apparently I just signed up for skydiving. And uh, yeah, it's like, oh, but didn't you have a breakup yesterday? It's like, yeah, but I'm going skydiving today. So like, I'm not thinking about that right now. I love that breakups were like the Adderall of efficiency for you. Like, I appreciate yeah, that so yeah. much. <laughs> yeah, it's like a different kind of survival all of a sudden. It's like, well, you know, emotionally, you're feeling really bad. But like, now you have to think about actual survival because, you know, you're going bungee jumping. So I guess, <laughs> you know, that just that substitutes so the problem. <laughs> so extreme. I know. I'm I mean, like, too. I, exactly. But see, but that's why it's like, mm -hmm. oh, it's better to have the balance. And actually, yeah. it has taken... Yeah you know, again, years of self-awareness and like really understanding to say like, no, like I want to develop my emotional vocabulary and like, yeah. I want to feel these emotions and it's okay to feel these emotions. And like, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's so funny because now I have a toddler son and yeah. like, I'm constantly being like, it's okay when he cries, like go ahead and cry. Like it's cool, you know? And so I kind of feel like I'm, you know, learning from my own experiences and mistakes and trying to be yeah. like, it's fine cry if you want like that's like your mo that's like your main language right now your language is not developed so you just have to cry when you need something you know i appreciate yeah. that so much i love that <laughs> for those of you who are listening it is not easy for us to get here and normalize this stuff and so dr judy i so appreciate your honesty and your vulnerability not just in being an expert in this field and compassionate and hopeful but also just like telling your truth about it too and giving us the hope through that <laughs> Thank you. And you too. And I really admire the work that you do. And so much of us are just carrying so much stress and so much trauma without working through it. So I mean, like I, like I said, I've seen somatic experiencing change lives. So I'm so excited that you're doing that. And like, 
I actually talk about that in just like some small ways yeah. in my book. I don't think of myself as a somatic experiencing expert by any means, but like yeah. for the techniques that are accessible and the yeah. ones that I talk my clients yeah. through, I do feature them in this book I as well. That. I saw that and I was so excited yeah. to see like just some some really accessible, easy, not accessible, easy, but accessible, not always easy yes. practices that people yeah. can start to really apply for themselves. And I love that. Yeah, that's the goal. Everyone, I want you to go get The New Rules of Attachment by Dr. Judy Ho and read it, message us, tell us what your quiz results are, let us know your attachment confessionals. <laughs> and- <laughs> And where can people find more of you? Where on on the socials, on the website? Tell us. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, you can find me at Dr. Judy Ho across social media platforms. Instagram's my primary. And then you can find free resources, the quiz and other bonuses at my website, drjudyho.com. I also have a newsletter you can sign up for there. And I give freebies to my newsletter subscribers all the time. So just watch out for that too. Nice. Get on that newsletter. Go follow Dr. Judy on the socials. And soon you'll be able to watch us on TikTok play Street Fighter with each other. Get excited. Yay! I know. <laughs> or laser tag. Or laser or tag. Both, so. Whatever. All of the yes. above. Dr. Judy, thank you yes. so much for being on the Gently Used Human. You are a delight. I am going to give everyone a little excitement. Dr. Judy will be back and we're going to talk about a different subject later on. And thank you Yay. all for listening and being the incredible Gently Used Humans that you are. Thank you for listening to the Gently Used Human podcast with Dr. Scott Lyons and friends. Visit GentlyUsed.com for fun extras, including submitting your questions for advice from a Midwestern mom. And don't forget to spill the tea and gossip about the show with all your friends and frenemies. And you know what? Show us some love by giving us five stars and leaving a review in your favorite apps. This helps us connect with all the other gently used humans out there. Oh, and by the way, you look fierce today. <laughs> <laughs>